It was a three minute drive to the neighboring farm and a 30 minute walk. Nina walked. She wanted time to figure out how to handle her neighbor, Rose. At the bank earlier that morning, when the gossipy teller, Louise Logan, had asked after Rose, Nina had known how to answer. She had seen her neighbor only once, right after the news about Rose's son, Lance, in a stilted visit to deliver flowers and meatloaf. Since then, Rose had shut herself off. And the short, shameful answer was that Nina didn't know how she was. Warmth from the black macadam drifted up her pant legs. Canned pears and seven, seven single serving plastic containers of bean chili thumped against the small of her back, shifting in her tote bag. The mid-morning sky was bright. A few cirrus clouds belying storm condition notices. Storm warners, doomsayers, people who held sway over your life with words, words, words. Never actions. They've been wrong before. But they've been right sometimes, too. Nina pulled the tote closer, and pears sloshed in their syrup. Yellow wildflowers sprouted in the spring grass by the edge of the road, turning up their faces like little portents of happiness. It stuck in Nina's craw that Louise Logan, of all people, had guilted her into visiting. Louise, with her dyed chestnut page voice swishing around a jawline that didn't need accentuating and her wet, bright eyes watching too intently. She reminded Nina of a bowl, something that tunneled, that sat perfectly still, jaws working and working, looking behind to see who else was there, and then darting under for reasons known only to herself. Now, here Nina was, sent on a mission by a woman she didn't like to check up on a woman who didn't like her. A mailbox rose up, rusty along the scenes, its flag stuck into an upright position. Rose's driveway was narrower than she remembered. It looked spat out from among the tangly branches like a half-digested chicken bone. Nina stepped up the driveway, making a mental list of chores she could ask her father-in-law to do at home to keep him busy and out of her husband's hair. The less Perry crossed paths with his father, the better. Could she send an old man over here to repaint Rose's mailbox? <laughs> she ruled out that idea. He hadn't come to Rose's place in years. The house appeared around a final bend. Its shingles and tilting chimney were jagged against the sky, and the whole place looked like it could give you a black eye. A crow cawed, flying in an ungainly path toward the barn. Nina crossed the creaky porch to the front door and knocked. There was no answer, so she went around back. Curls of peeling paint sprinkled the porch floor. Rose, she called, rapping on the screen door. You home? She looked around the yard, no sign of life. She peered through the screen into the kitchen to call again. A putrid smell came from inside. She set the tote bag at her feet, wondering where to leave it. It would be fine on the porch for an hour or two, but where was Rose and what was that smell? What, what if Rose had... She pushed the screen door open. Hello? A source, the source of stink was clear as soon as she entered. The trash can overflowed and dirty dishes cluttered the counters and table. Nina made a spot for her bag and pulled out the items that needed to go in through the refrigerator. She opened the fridge door and stood, honest to God, stunned. It was a tin foil shrine. <laughs> At least 10 casserole dishes untouched in varying stages of moldy putrescence, a gallon of chunky milk, something furry in a produce bag. On the door, littlest slimy jam and pickle jars and one pristine stick of butter. Here was the answer to, to Louise's question. Lord, Rose, Rose, you're what, 10 years older than me? You can't be losing it, you just can't. You have to pull it together. She shut the fridge door and went to the living room, calling Rose's name. Nina walked quietly through the rest of the house as if to lessen the impact of her intrusion. Upstairs, she paused outside the shut door that had been Lance's room and touched the wood. Then moved on. Rose's bedroom was empty. Down the back staircase, the, sh the sewing room had a twin bed that looked like it had recently held a body. Cans of corn were stacked in a pyramid in the corner. 
The dusty parlor was strangely warm, and she paused in front of the mantel. Five black feathers spanned out above the fireplace with a thorny branch of dry rose hips, the making of some decorative arrangement in the underworld. A family photo hung crooked above the mantel. Rose and her late husband, Theo, sat on either side of Lance. The boy looked like an imp, a sprite, a spirit that hadn't left him even after he was a lanky teen, knocking on her back door to take a walk with Syl. In the photo, he was about four. His face screwed into a, into a toothy smile, brown hair falling into his eyes. On Lance's right, Leo leaned back as if anticipating a blinding flash. Rose looked solid, her hands folded in her lap, staring straight into the camera like she could have bore through and touched the other side. A presence seemed to breathe into the house. Was that the screen door whining? Nina put a hand to her throat and turned around. Rose? How will she bear it? She had asked Mary when the news had broken. If she walked to the backyard, she'd surely find that spirited little boy from the photo sitting in the dirt with Syl and a hose making mud pies. Nina hurried back to Rose's kitchen. The screen door wasn't quite shut, so she pulled it tight in its frame, and on the fridge door stood two strawberry-shaped magnets. They held a sheet of paper folded in half. A faint etching of black ink pressed through the white sheet. Nina unclipped it and unfolded the page. <laughs> now she was just snooping. Louise Logan would be proud. She ignored her trembling fingers. Her daughter's name, name ran bold and black across the top of the paper. It was an email that Syl had printed out, dated five months back. The subject line read, For my mom. Dear Mom, my best girl says she'll pass this message on to you. I haven't had time to write a paper letter. How are you? The food here is terrific. Not as ever, and it's been real hot. I wish I could time travel back for the weekend for some good food. Damn that I don't have superpowers. <laughs> don't worry about me. We are careful. How is Fergus? I'll write more next week. Maybe even pick up a real pen. Better go. There's a country that needs saving. Oh boy. Love, Lance. Nina refolded the paper and returned it to its place on the fridge. Syl had never told her she relayed emails to Rose, but it made sense. Her daughter was now locked in a dance with Rose that Nina couldn't follow. Syl had been as in love as a girl could be at 16. Nina remembered her own youthful passion with Perry, wrenching an electric and cursed Lance for mixing it up with Syl before heading off to war. Then, just as fast, she grabbed the cross around her neck and offered up a quick plea for forgiveness. And for Rose, a prayer for her too. Not that she'd want Nina's prayers. All told, Nina was in Rose's empty house for almost two hours. She lugged out the trash, filled the sink with soapy water, washed the dishes, stacked in it, and the pots lined in the counters. Holding her nose, she, un she emptied everything from the fridge, pouring liquids down the drain, scraping solids into the garbage can, and took out the trash again. She scoured every casserole dish and scrubbed the fridge shelves, and then found some baking soda to set inside. She washed Fergus's food bowl, filled his water dish, and swept the floor. And then she set her chili in the sparkling fridge, leaving the canned pears on the table, and took out a piece of paper from the shelf under the phone. Dear Rose, I stopped by today and I apologize for letting myself in, but I brought some chili that had to go into the fridge. I also brought some fruit I canned. We had too much. I hope you enjoy it. I was very sorry to miss you. Rose, I'm so sorry for what has happened. I pray for Lance every day. Syl cries in her room. Syl is heartbroken. No, 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 no. Syl misses him too. She said, staring out the window. What more is there to say? I'm sorry we aren't closer, Rose, the way we used to be. I have no good excuse other than can you ever just just because I have their name doesn't mean I like them. No. no. Will you please call me to let me know you've got this? Yours truly. 
just as she was going to make a clean copy and, and sign her name, an engine rumbled into the yard. Rosa struck. Nina knew the sound of that old junker. Stupidly, she hadn't checked the side of the house where it was usually parked. Rosa had just gone to town, out driving, running errands like any normal person. She didn't want Nina's charity. Nina leaped up from the table. Her chair clattered onto the floor, no fluttering after it. The pen she found in the drawer near the phone rolled off the table toward a crack by the baseboards. She grabbed her tote bag and rushed out the back door, rounding the house and cutting through the shrubs toward the low wall that separated the yard from the fields. She chucked the bag over the wall and scrambled after it into the corn. Behind her, the hayloft leaned at a funny angle, and a bird minced from one corner of the eaves to another. Nina half jogged home, only pausing when she hit the base of the hill. Ooh, the brown house was the only place for miles with a view, a sloping elevation starting just past the old carriage barn and leveling off 20 feet above ground. Who had the luxury in the old days of using horses for any purpose other than working the fields? For that was how Perry's great-grandfather, Elias Brown, had done it. Hitched up the horses to push dirt into the homemade hill, then he packed it down hard. Earth heaped as a pedestal out of healers or spiritual symbolism or just a desire to look down at the neighbors. The house re appeared reproachful to Nina. She felt utterly ridiculous dodging Rose like that. In the laundry room, she slung her braid away from her hot neck and peeled off her dirty sweatshirt and washed her hands and face. The lunch hour had come and gone. She strode to the kitchen and pulled out the orange juice and paused listening for sounds upstairs. Nothing. She took a long drink, cold and sweet, from the carton. The downstairs bathroom door bashed against the wall. Storm's coming, the old man said, shuffling in. Zipper, she replied, setting the carton back on the shelf. Ever since he'd been struck by lightning out near the infamous elm, he'd been slipping. He walked out of the bathroom once with his pepper still hanging out of his pants. But aside from that one thing, she didn't mind the change. He was humbler now and didn't act like he owned the world. Seen Syl? she asked. Syl had claimed cramps this morning and begged Nina to let her call in sick to school. Nina had agreed, though that excuse, like all the others, was wearing thin. At first she had indulged Syl's grief, but her daughter had to learn how to stand against it, keep going. And if that meant Nina had to be brisk or cold, well, so be it. The old man shook his head, clacking his, claim against the, his cane against the table legs as he settled into a chair and gave a phlegmy cough. Oh, I can feel it coming. She had enough of kitchens for one day. <laughs> Nina went up to the second floor without another word to her father-in-law. As she expected, Sue wasn't in her room. There had been no sign of her at Rose's. Maybe they had gone to town together. Nina sat on Syl's bed, running her hand over the pink flowered comforter cover. How will she bear it? She whispered to Perry, meaning Rose, of course. But she met Syl too. On a cork board above Syl's dresser was a photo of Lance. He leaned back against a tree trunk and looked into the camera with his head tilted. The expression in his eyes, a soft velvety brown, was blatantly seductive. Looking at it now, Nina knew they slept together. That bolt of knowledge made her scan his face for deceit. But she saw just a boy looking seductive, seductively at her. Nina, with a question in his eyes that she couldn't decipher. Thank God still hadn't gotten pregnant. She pulled the comforter cover into her fist and then smoothed it out again. It would be necessary for Perry to take over Rose's land. What she seen today made that quite clear. If the Browns didn't get it, the bank would. Perry would require Nina's firm hand on his shoulder to see it through, just as he needed her encouragement to stand up to the old man. She took a breath before she stood and then fluffed Sill's pillow. Downstairs, the old man still sat in the kitchen, listening to the radio. The weatherman, Ted Waite, recited a list of counties on alert. She turned the volume down. How about fixing Sills' bike? The front wheel has some vet spokes.
She was usually able to get the old man to do things for her, though she didn't push. First, she'd ask him to do the bike. And if he balked at that, she'd move on to one thing she really wanted, the rabbit fence for her kitchen garden. She'd learned how to, she'd learned how to handle her father-in-law through the trial and error, and unlike Perry, she didn't take one stone for a whole wall. He stuck his pinky finger into his ear and then withdrew it for inspection. I'll take a look. That'd be great. She opened the dishwasher and started unloading. Not today. Okay, whenever you can. Perry planned to ask his father again about the idea to try some livestock. She urged him to. It was past time that he took over officially, and the way his father was stringing him along would only bring more bitterness. The old man coughed. He'd sit there for hours rattling the newspaper and working his post-nasal drip. <laughs> if she turned around now, she'd hurl something or scream. We've got to get ready, he said. Toast crumbs littered the sink. She rinsed them down the drain and wiped her hands on a dish towel. I know. She had the storm routine down pat. They'd done it often enough when tornadoes had cut close, but ultimately passed them by. Nina would open windows to give the wind, lee to give the wind leeway, and then she'd help the old man to the root cellar, and they'd sit, breathing the dank air, until the battery-operated radio gave the all clear. She put her empty mug into the dishwasher and shut the door with a click. The old man looked at his fingertips, pushing them together in a steeple shape. Perry and his old man would duke it out until the old man finally relented and let Perry make some decisions. And it would be up for her, to her, Nina, to referee, to make sure it didn't implode. And here's the tricky part, that it did. A necessary tumult before resolution. More coffee, she asked, feeling her failure in the question. The old man stood, a struggle in the way he pushed himself against the wood table. His bones were worrying him. He crumpled the snotty napkin onto his dirty plate and pushed it, not unkindly, into the counter next to Nina. Then he reminded her about the sheets on the line and limped out the door, probably to corral the sun. Wind pushed against the kitchen, the kitchen curtains, and Nina grabbed the laundry basket from its spot near the back door and stepped outside. She felt a sheet, pulled a handful to her nose, and deemed it dry enough. Light blue cloth slid off the line into her plastic basket, and a queen-sized vista opened up in front of her where there had been per cow. The same view she'd seen while gardening and hanging laundry for the past 17 years. The downslope with its scratchy grass and the start of the field, the big sky. There was the storm, all right, a heavy bank of clouds in the west miles away. She felt a prick in the air, a twingy feeling in her forearms and the back of her neck. The storefront cued in the rest of her senses. A breeze brought a smell of manure and minerals on a whip of super-oxygenated air. Barry's tractor grew louder. He must be pulling it up near the shed. Once he cut the engine, an expected silence fell. She pictured him sitting in the high seat, not yet moving, listening for her as she listened for him. Here we go again, stumbling through the motions and pulling up, startled to find ourselves in the thick of it in the thickets. If someone asked her whether she knew what to do in the event of an emergency, she would laugh and say, of course. But that's not what Louise Logan asked her, or Rose or Syl. How will we bear it? On the horizon, heavy clouds dipped low towards the ground and then dipped again. She saw a little upside-down peak form, an exploratory finger soon sucked back into the larger mass. It emerged again and then again larger each time until the peak became a funnel, dipping down and swirling back to itself. She'd often seen them from a distance. Once she watched two funnels emerge from the same cloud, a dark ribbon and its shadow twisting together, receding from view. This one wasn't receding. It was heading toward them, far enough away, but growing, a blurry gray-black churning and a strengthening. Nina felt a pain in her stomach. Oh, she completely forgotten to eat lunch. There was something about the shape's quickness, the darting of it that reminded her of a child at play. What if Syl wasn't with Rose? What if she was somewhere else in the path and unprotected? Nina ran into the kitchen. The old man had the back panel off the transi transistor radio and was rummaging the drawer for batteries. 
Percy came through the front door just as she set down the basket and turned to the phone. Here he was, finally, her husband, his eyes squinty and his face red. He asked for Syl. She's with Rose, Nina said, and Perry nodded. The phone line was dead. His hands dangled at his sides as they always did when he was indoors, knobby and rough. Syl's gotta be with Rose, Nina repeated. The old man agreed, though she had no idea how he would know. He scarcely acknowledged his granddaughter most days. Perry looked at them both blankly, and the old man headed to the bathroom, grabbing his belt buckle as he went down the hall. She knew what Perry would say before his words came. He rubbed a palm against the leg of his dirty jeans. The old man said no. Nina took a breath. As long as he has a grip, we'll never... She couldn't... She could finish that sentence and had a hundred different ways, threats, warnings, pleas, predictions. The skin of her neck felt creepy, still warm from her running through the fields. She pictured Syl and Rose crouched together in that tiny sewing room, whispering, backs curved around their memories of lambs. Down the hall, the bathroom door handle smacked against the wall. Nina shrugged, let them have the place. Better yet, let the storm take it. A far-off storm siren wailed just as the old man clattered back into the kitchen. Nina brushed a hand over her face and grabbed his elbow. Perry took his father's other side, and the three of them angled awkwardly toward the front door. A six-legged beast. Seven, if you count the old man's cane. As she swung the front door wide, the wind, the wind stirred her braid and lifted her shirt tails. They stepped into an ocean of noise, that first lick of wind promising salvation. Lift me up. Take me out of here. We've got it, Nina yelled across the old man to Perry. Go, do one more check for Syl. Perry turned back towards the house. He'd better move his ass, the old man said, and started down the sloping hill to the storm cellar. He was moving too fast and wobbled, flailing his cane. She lunged for him and grabbed his arm, but he shook her off, impatient as a kid. It struck her as it often had, that he wasn't holding control of the lamb to punish them. He was holding on as a boy holds on to his favorite toy, a prehensile greed, that aversion to sharing that most of us unlearn or pretend to. She kept pace and grabbed his elbow. He tried to shake free again, and she needed to say something sharp, pull him into line, but instead she shook him right back, pulling his elbow toward her and then shoving. He crumpled his hand latching onto her wrist. They fell together, rolling down the slope. The old man gripped so hard the bones of her wrist shifted. A pebble bounced off her cheek and she clamped her eyes shut. The air rushed by, fabric tore. Someone yelled and elbow clocked her in the head. They rolled to a stop. And by the time she disentangled her limbs and struggled to her knees, Perry was there, yanking her to her feet. The old man still held, held her wrist, and she grabbed him with her other hand and helped Perry pull him up. His eyes blazed as she unpeeled his fingers. Take him, she said, her breath snagging. Up the slope, a yellow t-shirt. There's still, she yelped, scrambling up the hill. She heard Perry yell something she couldn't catch. Nina fell onto her hands once. The whole sky crunched, and at last she stood face to face with her daughter. Syl's eyes were bruises. Nina put her hands on her daughter's shoulders. There was blood on the yellow shirt. One of them was bleeding. They had to get to the cellar. Come on, she grabbed Syl's hands and backed down the hill. You aren't lost. You're here with me. It may not be what you want, but this is home. We... Screaming wind blew Syl's hair up and back, and her lips moved too, too fast. Something about an album, lost, trying to find. Then Syl broke away and ran in the wrong direction. There was nothing to do but follow.